So today we will be uh, talking about our final topic, which is weak interactions. So we have covered uh, uh, QED, electromagnetic interactions, which is essentially electromagnetic interactions, and then we move to strong interactions, which we spend a lot of time. Now, uh, we are going to spend a little bit of time on weak interactions. So, weak interactions um, uh, have, so a new kind of interactions was required for particles which are decaying. Uh, these are completely different in nature compared to strong and electromagnetic interactions, but lessons learned from them will be useful to understand these uh, um, lessons learned from strong interactions, okay, the way can be useful, like for example, gauge theories, approximate symmetries, so this is in this case QD and then perturbative to CD. Approximate symmetries means it has spontaneous symmetry breaking. And these ideas can be, uh, both these ideas have to be incorporated to understand uh, weak interactions. Uh, these were, are the most complex uh, sort of, uh, 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 of all the three interactions, I would say these are the most complex of the three interactions because uh, calculations in them are much harder and uh, they involve all the bunch of uh, meaning all the standard model particles and uh, uh, everything interacts and and also they involve complexities technical complexities involving with uh, renormalizability and massless states of uh, the gauge bosons etc etc uh, massive states of the gauge bosons, etc. So, for these reasons, the weak interactions are, uh, I would say, the mo one of the most complex of these uh, uh, interactions to all to understand actually. Uh, so, in the first lecture, we'll just go chronologically. Um, we'll just go through the bunch of uh, uh, the theories which existed before the standard model, and the next two lectures will spend on, on standard model actually. Uh, this is, I think, we should. Uh, 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 this, if you want, uh, this is one of the triumphs of uh, quantum field theory and uh, uh, understanding of our understanding of gauge theories. So, let's go chronological order. Um, so, so to begin with. Uh, one of the first theory, uh, is the first observations were essentially nuclear decay. We had beta decay, which had neutron going to proton, electron plus antineutrino. Okay, as soon as uh, QD came into the picture, so neutrino was introduced by. Pauli, Pauli, uh, you know the story that uh, if you plot uh, the energy of the electron and the number of events, uh, okay, so the number of events and the energy of the electron. If it is a two body decay, okay, you would expect uh, something like this. So, a red line. But what you actually observe is something like this. Okay, so there is uh, a relative aspect essentially is something like in the Curie plot. Okay. So, uh, This is expected from uh, two body decay, just from energy momentum conservation and whereas this 
if you have a three body decay and the, so uh, okay so in the two body decay you can uh, precisely determine the energy and momentum of the decaying particles because they go back to back and everything you won't expect a continuous spectrum but whereas in a three body spectrum in a three body decay you would expect a continuous spectrum because uh, the particles uh, could uh, uh, could uh, the electron could take a range of energies rather than one particular energy so you can take a range of energies and that is essentially what this continuous spectrum looks like essentially you have some sort of uh, range of energies in which the electron takes the, uh, the energies and at this particular energy uh, so uh, at some very extreme points the electron energy would be almost close to zero and at some points it will be the highest possible because the, the proton energy would be at almost zero and the neutron energy would be almost zero so okay so when uh, there could be points at which uh, the electron takes away all the energy to uh, the kinetic energy uh, kinetic, uh, available energy whereas the other extreme would be when the electron has zero energy meaning zero velocity so these possibilities exist and that's the reason uh, this is only possible if you have a, two, a three body decay instead of a two body decay in a two body decay everything is sort of fixed because we have looked at it uh, both these aspects anyway we have looked at it earlier when you are studying kinematics uh, reduced to kinematics so to so this was the idea of uh, Pauli that uh, uh, you have an invisible particle which is essentially the neutrino which is coming along with the electron and that's the reason why we are saying this particular uh, um, uh, what do you call it, continuous spectra of the electron okay and uh, this turned out to be true so uh, we don't have really energy moment violations but instead you really have this three body decay a new particle which is the electron so this was in early 30s um, Okay, um, when this was uh, proposed by Pauli, um, and soon after, uh, Fermi wrote a theory this was in 1933, soon after, around the same time actually, perhaps, uh, okay, uh, wrote a theory around 19. 30s, early 30s, uh, based on QED. So remember uh, the QED theory is essentially again a current current interaction. You had L interaction in QED is psi electron gamma mu psi. and then with a coupling constant and this couples to a photon essentially in this is just the interaction part of the qd interaction so you have a current a direct current vectorial current coupling to a vector which is essentially a photon So this is the electron wave function which now so this is the Lagrangian interaction term uh, interaction uh, interaction term of the Hamiltonian or the interaction term of the Lagrangian. Now what uh, Fermi uh, wrote uh, realized was okay there is no real mediator because these interactions are uh, point like. So some features, okay. Before writing theory, we'll let's just look at some features of uh, these are point-like interactions. 
that means uh, uh, they, they don't really have some sort of long distance surface, no real long distance. distance effects. That means, so these, uh, the decay happens at distance scales much, much smaller than the Fermi scale as an, or the, uh, what do you call, one Fermi. The decay deep inside the nucleus. The nucleus so the nucleus is one Fermi, so the distance of the decay is really very, very deep. Essentially, we take uh, the decay interaction, what happens is at a distance scale, much, much less than a one Fermi. So it is like a point interaction. It's not like uh, the neutron, um, uh, meaning it just suddenly decays into a proton and an electron, uh, okay, and some antineutron. It's not like uh, there is a uh, distance scale within the proton, uh, within the neutron, which let's see, leads it to some sort of uh, uh, decay at a later stage or no such thing. It, it doesn't happen at the Fermi scale or at the one Fermi radius. It happens deep inside. So the second feature is uh, that it is uh, a very weak interaction. Compared to strong interactions or Electromagnetic interactions. Okay, definitely compared to strong interactions. Okay, we'll skip this part again. We'll come back to it maybe uh, a bit later. Okay, in the comparison with electromagnetic interactions. But let's just say that. Uh, Compared to strong nuclear forces, this is definitely um, uh, a weak interaction because uh, uh, from the data, uh, from the observation of the data, you can know that, uh, let's say, for, uh, meaning these are sufficiently long lived, meaning they don't really immediately decay. They, these particles are sufficiently long lived that they can leave tracks in the detector. Okay, so you should be able to see the tracks and uh, uh, and the uh, Various things essentially you can see the tracks of the uh, meaning they are sufficient long lived and they don't produce copy. I mean, uh, so I, I remember uh, we, we discussed this point again and again in the talk that in the production, they are not their uh, production. Uh, meaning, uh, you need to introduce this new set of interactions purely because uh, when there are uh, strongly interacting particles they actually get produced much more, much more compared to their decay rates. Say for example, the decay is much, much weaker. So it's not the same uh, interaction which is uh, corresponding to the production of this strongly interacting particles like pi ions or k ions or something. Uh, and if they are produced with a, an interaction of the same strength and the decaying with the same strength, then they should, their lifetime should not be so far meaning their lifetime should be very, very small, right? Meaning they are being produced so copiously, so they should decay also pretty fast. But that's not what is happening. Actually, they are decaying uh, much slower. So you can actually see their uh, tracks being left. They are sufficiently long-lived and everything. So, and uh, since I said, okay, and then we can also estimate uh, their, uh, uh, their strength a bit later. Uh, once I, I'll just say essentially one. You can also estimate this one. Third one it violates flavor symmetries. So 
So it violates flavor symmetries in the sense that it violates symmetries like you know uh, strangeness quantum number at that level. Now we can see uh, this is true even now actually that uh, this is uh, we know the origins and the next two lectures you will see that it the, these flavor symmetries are completely violated by the weak interactions. Uh, so in the, in those days, if you look at it, the K1 or uh, Pion uh, decays, you notice that uh, flavor symmetries like uh, strangeness uh, um, and etc. etc. So like flavor quantum numbers, upness, downness, all these things are violated. So strangeness quantum number upness, downness, bottomness, all these flavor symmetries which are conserved with the strong interactions and of course definitely by the electromagnetic interactions are violated by the weak interaction. So if you want, uh, the, I would say that these are the three main features of uh, uh, weak interactions and which distinguish them from say strong interactions like uh, one, they are point-like. Uh, meaning there are no long distance uh, features, okay. And they are really like uh, they happen at a very, very small distance scale, okay. Um, unlike strong interactions, which are pretty long, meaning they could be as long as uh, uh, one for me or something. Uh, uh, all this comparison I am doing with strong nuclear forces, so. Um, then uh, and of course weak uh, electromagnetic interactions are also pretty long distance as you know and uh, they are extremely weak interaction compared to strong interactions because the decay lifetimes um, the decay widths are uh, uh, meaning much smaller compared okay uh, meaning they are living with their lifetimes are su sufficiently large so that they could be seen in collider and uh, you can they leave tracks and everything and it violates flavor symmetries like strangeness, upness, bottomness, uh, all this flavor which are of the quarks, uh, which are violated by this uh, uh, by, by these symmetries, by these interactions. So the first uh, interaction was written at the uh, level of neutron and proton. Uh, but for me, there he wrote it down in terms of a, again a current current interaction. By constant GF, psi bar n gamma mu for the neutron, E times for the neutron. So what he did was that he wrote a Dirac. Uh, um, so because you don't have a photon because it's a very very short distance effect, you don't really have a mediator or something like a uh, photon. Um, so what he wrote down was that again a current current interaction. So it should be like a current current interaction. So this is a current interaction made up of Dirac spinors which we have seen. Then he made another current current interaction with electron and neutrino. So these are two vectorial currents. Okay, he wrote down in terms of two ve uh, vectorial currents interacting with each other. Okay, so two vectorial currents interacting with the strength GF. GF is some constant which we call it as the Fermi constant. So this interaction, if you draw the Feynman diagram of this interaction, uh, this would look somewhat like this. Uh, okay, these are this is four Fermi's. Okay, so in the Lagrangian, uh, the Lagrangian has uh, dimension four. Okay, a dimension four. It turns out the, this Lagrangian is a dimension six operator. It's a dimension six operator. So, since given that the Lagrangian should be 
L should be the dimension of the Lagrangian should be 4 because remember action should be dimensionless. So S is equal to integral d power 4 for 4 dimensions L the Lagrangian density. So this gives me a minus 4 dimensions. So this should be 4 dimensions. So if you put in the Dirac Lagrangian, it turns out psi has a dimension 3 by 2. Okay. Since psi has a dimension 3 by 2, this L interaction Fermi has a dimension 6. This implies the Fermi constant has mass dimensions 1 by mass square. So dimension minus 2. Okay, so it should have units like GeV power minus 2. Because each of them contains um, a 3 by 2, each uh, Dirac spanner has a, a 3 by 2 dimension. So this is a 6 dimensional operator, 3 by 2 times 4. Okay. So, um, but we need that the Lagrangian dimension should be dimension 4. So, this constant should be having mass dimensions minus 2. Okay. Uh, now, uh, the, uh, this leads you the constant of the Fermi constant V. So, so what, what is this thing? This is like a vectorial current times current. But instead, the second current is not made up of photon or something. There are no mediators at this level. But it is also made up of another uh, um, uh, fermionic vectorial current. Okay, it is made up of another fermionic vectorial current. Okay, now so if you draw the Feynman diagram for this, this would look like. Okay, this interaction would look like neutron. Proton, electron, neutron. This is sometimes called as a contact interaction. Okay, this is something called as a contact interaction. Uh, which is also a four for me interaction or uh, four for me one interaction. So this is a four for me one interaction which happens at a particular point. This is the vertex. So earlier we had vertices in which the current goes to a photon or something, but instead this photon, uh, the, in this case, all the four particles and all the three. Uh, all the four fermion particles just lie at some certain single point, they interact at a single point. That is the essence of this four fermion, uh, fermion interactions, four fermion interactions. So, this is a contract so called a contact interaction. And this is just the strength. So this vertex factor, if you want to write a corner of entity and then compute uh, these Feynman diagrams, would give you a strength like GF. This interaction would have a strength which is less than GF. So if there is an incoming neutron and an outgoing proton, okay, and antineutron and an outgoing and uh, incoming electron, uh, outgoing electron, okay. So this would look like this essentially. So the neutron would come and then you would have this kind of a current which is electronic current and this is the hadron current. Notice that uh, it, it shows that how um, 
leptons and hadrons can interact with each other. So the weak interactions is the only thing which allows you the leptons and hadrons to interact with each other. So, this is also possible in electromagnetic interactions. We have seen, say, for example, E plus C minus going to bottom bottom pair. Okay. Uh, now, in this case, so also something uh, we have an interaction which is contact, but it is a long distance interaction, sort of uh, uh, much larger. But uh, this is uh, a very, very short distance interaction. Okay. Well, this is true also for QED interactions, but uh, uh, the, here it is a direct interaction, it is a contact interaction sort of thing. Okay. Here in this case, it is a contact interaction between leptons and hadrons. So, in principle, you have L interaction can be written in terms of L hadronic times, uh, sorry. Uh, can be written in terms of GF by root 2 on the convention. So, L hadronic times, um, sorry, again I am using the wrong notation. So, J hadronic times J leptonic, where J hadronic is a neutron proton current, vector current, and uh, J leptonic is a leptonic part. Now, uh, why uh, there is actually a reason why we do that because remember the hadronic current which we have written uh, is between composite objects. Neutrons and protons eventually turned out to be our composite objects. Okay, there are really composite objects, so in principle, you should be able to. Uh, put in um, some form factors in front of these things because uh, composite objects do not have exact couplings, but you will have smearing of the coupling, so which is uh, so one should put in uh, form factors. So there will be form factors, we will come to it in a second actually. <coughs> Now, this theory, uh, the Fermi theory, has uh, several issues. First of all, it uh, does not, um, uh, it is a non renormable theory. Um, it is a vector vector current, okay. And uh, uh, so, higher order correction, uh, so higher order corrections were hard to compute. Are uh, hard to compute. I just use the uh, meaning a simple word, but essentially what happens is uh, the, uh, the cross sections using the Fermi theory are not completely correct. Okay, the cross sections if you use Fermi theory, they are not uh, correct they increase significantly and uh, uh, so that is the reason why these cross sections uh, grow drastically with energy after certain age a uh, certain energy scale they actually start increasing uh, exponentially with energy and so they do not really match with the data. There was another thing which came up uh, around the same time which also led to the modification of requirement for the modification of Fermi theory, uh, which is called uh, the tau theta puzzle, which essentially led to uh, so 
So this puzzle actually played a big role in particle physics development of particle physics. Mm. Uh, so at that time, uh, tau and uh, theta were considered to be two different particles. So, so uh, they had the same mass, had the same mass. charge and uh, mean half-life all of them almost the same so these two particles tau plus and theta plus okay so they had uh, okay they looked like but so but this decays mostly into pi plus two pi's whereas this decays into 3 pi so it looks like uh, uh, one of them has even parity and the other has odd parity I think this we covered uh, later on so this is nothing but your k plus in the present day essentially this is the k meson ok now uh, later on we had uh, uh, there were other things also which the k uh, this same tau theta puzzle led to uh, discovery of CP violation in weak interaction so this uh, to solve this puzzle what uh, uh, so people said that okay this could be the same particle but uh, or the uh, meaning uh, 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 more than that it could be that so there are two Li and Yang proposed to solve this puzzle that parity is not conserved in weak interactions so weak interactions violate parity so uh, in other words it means that uh, only certain chiral um, combinations of currents take part in weak interactions okay so that means uh, uh, so in terms of the Dirac spinors the Dirac vector current so if you have this vector current so these vector currents can be divided into two parts uh, left vector currents right vector currents so one of only one of these currents would take part in weak interactions because if you have both of them then parity is conserved because if you, uh, the weak interactions participate in both of them the parity is conserved now i have already mentioned you the thing but this was a non trivial uh, analysis which was later done actually okay um, but before uh, proceeding further this was experimentally this proposal they also they also proposed experiments how to test this idea so it conducted by CS Wu who confirmed that in a very famous experiment that parity is violated in weak interactions So here the basic uh, picture is that there is a cobalt 60 going to a nickel 60 plus electron antineutrino okay so th th uh, this was a setup which was considered actually by CS Wu. <coughs> so 
So they had uh, some sort of uh, uh, detector which was both in the forward direction and in the backward direction. So you have uh, um, some sort of, okay, let me uh, draw a sketch. This is not really uh, so uh, up to the the best representation. Let me draw the best representation. So you have cobalt 60 here and you are looking at, uh, so you uh, looking at decays of this cobalt 60 and you have something called a forward detector. And then you have another thing called a backward detector. Uh, give me a second. My pencil has discharged the so backward detector. So the cobalt, uh, so cobalt would be decaying here and here, everywhere essentially. It should be in principle four pi directions. So what you would expect if parity is conserved is that the number of events in forward direction and number of events in the backward direction, if parity is conserved, should be same. So NF should be equal to NB. But if parity is violated, NF will not be equivalent to backward direction. So you have some preferential direction of these decays. Okay. <coughs> so and this is what I so preferential direction so either towards the forward direction or towards the backward direction but there will be a difference. So it won't be equal this NF and the number of events in the forward direction and number of events in the backward direction. Perhaps uh, you'll see more details in your experimental particle physics course, but uh, we will, uh, uh, meaning for us, this is enough, enough just to say that there is a preferential direction in the weak interaction decays essentially. So, so uh, it essentially tells you that if we are moving in the forward direction, uh, uh, the the spin of the particles orientation should be in the opposite direction okay or if you are moving in the backward direction the spin of the particle should be in the uh, towards the cobalt essentially or towards the, uh, the incident point only those events have uh, really uh, decays are possible uh, the other events uh, the decays are not possible so there there so so there is a preferential direction towards uh, a direction uh, where weak interactions can be seen in the weak interaction scenario. So this sort of confirm confirmed that weak interactions violate parity. Okay, this experiment sort of uh, confirmed the, uh, uh, no, okay, one important point actually I missed to mention is that this cobalt 60 has spin. So it has a non-zero spin essentially. So this, uh, so it will have a preference, the decay is will have depending upon the momentum direction, the projection of the spin, okay. So it will have it. Uh, that's the reason why you have a preferential direction if parity is conserved or parity is violated. Spin doesn't change under uh, a mirror, right? Essentially. So what you'll have is, but the momentum would change. So the forward momentum versus more uh, backward momentum. Okay. Uh, so uh, uh, this okay. This sort of uh, confirm that weak interactions violate parity. So theoretically. Fermi theory has to be modified. Now, how do you modify Fermi theory so as to fit parity violation into it? 
so this was the big question at the point and uh, there were several people marsha and sudarshan one of the first ones to do it feynman and gelman so these are the guys who introduced something called the b minus a theory so the idea first came from marsha and sudarshan how to get this and of course feynman and gelman did much more um uh, uh they explain they study the consequences and so on so as and so there is a much fatter paper but the first idea came from gelman uh, sudarshan and marshak so the basic idea is to introduce introduce uh, an projection operator One minus gamma phi by two. So this is a projection operator. So uh, okay. So this is a projection operator which uh, takes um, uh, currents. So so if you define psi l is equal to one uh, p l acting on psi, psi r is equal to p r acting on psi. This is the Dirac spinor. this is nothing but your chiral basis which we studied when we are doing a dirac equation so if you remember the the fermi theory has l fermi interaction is gf by root 2 psi bar gamma mu psi so n p psi bar gamma mu psi so nu e, e now instead of just vectorial currents you introduce uh, something 1 uh, minus gamma phi into it such that that takes out the projection of pl and pr okay so this gives me so l v minus say interaction is equal to psi uh, neutron gamma mu 1 minus gamma phi psi proton then psi electron gamma mu 1 minus gamma phi psi electron neutron now if we expand these currents these currents are nothing but g f by root 2 psi neutron gamma mu gamma p this is a vectorial current and then psi neutron minus psi neutron gamma mu psi p gamma phi here so here this is an actual vector current current same thing here so what's happening here is instead of having a purely vectorial current you are introducing something called a vectorial minus axial vector currents okay it's a combination of two different currents which uh, with a minus sign in between for both the neutron system and the leptonic hadronic uh, leptonic current essentially for both so this is for the hadronic current and this is for the leptonic current okay so here too you have psi electron gamma mu uh, maybe with the bottom index psi nu e okay minus psi electron gamma mu gamma phi which is just the definition of the actual vector current okay actual vector okay so you have uh, instead of having one single current okay you are now introducing an another current which is the actual vector current and separate uh, so putting a minus sign in between them so this is the v minus a current which is actually taking part instead of pure vector currents 
it is the v minus a currents vector minus actual vector currents which take play which take part in weak interactions <coughs> now remember these are again um, uh, for the neutron and proton these are again composite objects so you will have some other coefficients psi uh, so l interaction so v minus say would be psi bar c v minus gamma phi c a times psi proton psi neutron psi electron minus because this is completely uh, not a composite object it's an elementary object you leave it as it is so this is your theory of v minus a this is an uh, effective interaction oh i forgot the coupling constant g of pair two this is just nothing but the fermi coupling constant which is nothing g of pair two okay so this theory while its parity okay this theory while its parity and uh, this uh, worked very well actually the cv uh, people measured uh, what is gf what is cv and cva for various systems uh, so it uh, leads to things like you know uh, you can explain pi on decay you can explain various things from this kind of currents uh, with their uh, okay but still this is a non renormalizable theory people were not able to do higher order calculations so these are this was in the 1950s and like i said you can really reimpose it in terms of pl and pr um, in terms of purely left handed currents so lv minus a okay uh, interaction part e is essentially g of pair of 2 j left handed hadronic times j left handed leptonic where l here okay maybe i should put a capital l where l here is essentially left handed currents so instead of no uh, l here here means left handed where left handed means i introduce pl no so the only the pl projections of the dirac spinors would take part in this interactions okay only the uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, using the pl operator i only take the left handed projections and only this uh, things take part in uh, uh, in the weak interactions but still this theory was not uh, uh, it's a non renormalizable theory gf is mass dimension 1 by 2 so gf had something like so it was of the gf at that time was estimated to be 10 power minus 5 gv ev minus 2 inverse okay so or proton mass square okay 10 power minus 5 proton mass square now this is uh, uh, it's a non renormalizable operator and so higher order corrections uh we are not uh we are not systematic <coughs> so we are not systematic you cannot really remove all the infinities there are infinities were going left right and central so this b minus the theory while it explain the parity violation is not a fully consistent theory while explaining parity violation not a fully consistent you cannot really do so this was uh, not a consistent theory so people were looking for alternatives 
one of the things uh, uh, which came up uh, uh, was something called the intermediate vector boson theory. So this uh, is called an intermediate vector boson theory. Boson theory, which says that there are some um, mediators which are pretty heavy. So these are essentially some uh, mediators. So because they should be heavy because it's like a point part uh, point interaction like I mentioned. So there, um, if you use the Compton wavelength argument which you have been mentioning, so they. Uh, so they should be of the order of say hundreds of uh, GeV and that also suits pretty well. So if uh, GF by root 2 goes to something like G by MW square where MW is nothing but your intermediate vector boson. Mediate vector boson which mediates weak interaction. So in that case, what happens is the neutron proton diagram, I'm just sticking to neutron proton, but you can would have a particle like this W boson, which then decays into nu E and E. So this is a W particle and this mass of this W should be around 100 GeV, just from the arguments of uh, uh, just from the arguments of uh, you know uh, um, uh, of uh, the uh, what do you call Compton wavelength okay but still this theory had an issue because uh, W bosons the presence of massive gauge bosons leads to non renormizability because first of all it is not a renormizable theory secondly how do you restore symmetry? Symmetry. Uh, okay, uh, I'll just come to it. Okay, I'll just talk about symmetry. What is the symmetry? So this theory also had issues with renounceability. That means higher order corrections. Um, were not really explained very well. So the entire issue. Okay, now. So now there, there is an issue. So first of all, you have explained one particular property of the weak interactions, uh, which is uh, essentially uh, that the parity is violated, but you don't have a, a satisfying theory which explains this very well. Perhaps the reason why the, you don't really have a satisfying theory is because you don't even know what is exactly the, the symmetry which is governing the weak interactions. So you can ask the question, what is the symmetry which is governing the weak interactions? So uh, what could be the symmetry? Uh, what could be the symmetry uh, which would explain? So similar to in weak interactions, you had um, it's a human gauge symmetry. And in strong interactions, you had a C3 symmetry. What could be the symmetry? Uh, the symmetry which explains uh, say weak interactions so the weak interactions are explained in terms uh, so the first hint came from Schwinger in the early 1960s so he thought that uh, one could use su2 symmetry su2 symmetry to explain weak interactions so um, it's much easier to understand it in for the leptonic case because you also have muon decay say for example have muons 
going to a neutrino, new muonic neutrino, then a W, it's very similar electron nu. So, so the basic idea here is that you could have a, a pseudo symmetry where again like a flavor symmetry okay so that is the reason why weak interactions explanation sometimes the standard model is called quantum flavorodynamics okay so you can have some s2 symmetry where mu e and e form a doublet and new mu and mu form a du another doublet and the interaction between uh, so these are s2 interactions uh, these are s2 doublets And the interaction Lagrangian is governed by a local SU2 gate center. So uh, it was glacial, okay. So this was and some sort of an idea which was given by Schwinger. But then it was Glashow who worked it out actually and showed that a pure SU2 will not work. Okay, a pure SU2 theory will not be able to work uh, purely because uh, uh, neutron, uh, neutrinos are having zero electric charge, electrons have minus one. Okay. So, you cannot independently describe weak interactions like strong interactions. So, weak interactions should always be uh, sort of uh, described together with strong interact uh, with electromagnetic interactions. So, there is no independent way of describing weak interactions alone. Okay, and that is much much easily seen in terms of the case of say for example for uh, for uh, the leptons, but they, you can also see it for the hadrons. Say, for example, for the hadrons, hadrons, we have u and d. This has a charge two by three, and this has a charge minus one by three. So there is uh, this is a SU two doublet. The strong interactions are expressed for each u. Say, for example, you have uh, u red, u blue, and u green. Okay, so this is the strong interactions. Similarly, d green. Okay. Okay. So this is your strong interactions. So they deal with all the particles of the same charge. So the strong interactions act horizontally. So they deal with char particles of the same charge. Okay, same charge SU3 of the electric uh, QCD. Of the QCD. So they, they deal with the same charge. The flavor symmetries which are described to the uh, many classification of, uh, they are not gauge theories, right? They are global symmetries. So let's not worry about them. So they should not be confused. So they all deal with the electric, uh, same charge. But if you want to understand weak interactions where all the three colors come, so this is the SU2 doublet where there is an up to down. So electromagnetic charges uh, are different for up and down. So electromagnetic interactions form an inherent part if one wants to describe weak interactions. So you cannot independently uh, have a gauge theory only for weak interactions by neglecting electromagnetic. You cannot just set electromagnetic interaction to zero and then try to describe weak interactions. That won't be possible actually. So to resolve this thing, so what um, uh, Glashow did was introduce uh, 
uh, but before that uh, just to clarify this point essentially this SU2 uh, will be only on the left handed space by the way Uh, weak is only on the left handed fields fields that is say let's take the Dirac spinner of uh, uh, say up type uh, quark so psi up psi psi up type quark can be uh, decomposed into psi up psi l plus psi r so where psi l by 2 this is, the, uh, this is just uh, this thing psi u and then psi r is equal to 1 plus gamma phi by 2 psi so in shorthand notation uh, this just becomes u is equal to u l plus u r okay so the weak interactions only so u else only u else take part in weak interactions so that parity is valid so you are can take place in other all the strong interactions and uh, um, <coughs> and uh, and electromagnetic interactions, but you will will, uh, but it won't participate in weak interactions. The only you will uh, will participate. So you will essentially would be having its spin projection opposite to the direction of the momentum. Okay, so if it is spin projection is like this. Say for example, you will, whereas this will be parallel for. P. So this will be parallel for U R. So this will take part. Okay. In strong interactions, electromagnetic interactions. Whereas this will take part in strong, weak electromagnetic interactions. Okay. All the three interactions this will take part. So uh, the Dirac spinor, which is divided into two parts, essentially the left-handed part and the right-handed part. The left-handed part will take part in weak interactions, whereas the right-handed part will only take part in uh, will not take part in weak interactions. Okay. So we have seen this. Uh, how do you get these things? Also, uh, while we are doing the Carrel basis for the when you described uh, weak interaction, uh, I mean, uh, Dirac equation, um, some time ago. Now, as I said, okay, this is not sufficient. This is not sufficient um, because if you have an uh, because you'll have now. So in this new language, what you'll have essentially is that. This is UL DL, which will form an SE2 doublet, and then you will have UR DR, which are not uh, not participating in weak interactions. We don't really we'll keep them, but they won't. Uh, they are important for other things. We'll say, let's just leave it as it is. So these do not form SE2 doublets. So the UR and DR do not form SU2 doublets. Similarly, uh, neutrino 
electron left handed both of them left handed er for a, which is not a su2 doublet it's a su2 singlet or not a su2 doublet now the question is whether you should have uh, do you need new r you don't need new r because new r doesn't uh, you don't require uh, right handed neutrinos at all actually because neutrinos only participate participate in weak interactions so so if they only participate weak interactions new r need not exist because so what does the what is the interaction new r uh, will participate in actually it uh, there are so uh, they, it doesn't uh, participate in electromagnetic interactions it doesn't participate in weak in uh, meaning and a strong uh, strong interaction so there's nothing which new r would have any role to play actually so this led salam and other people to propose that neutrinos are only always left handed there are uh, there is a technical word of uh, meaning the two component spinors uh, so Uh, so neutrinos are only two component two component neutrino but anyway this essentially led to the idea that neutrinos are whatever neutrinos we discover in nature are always left handed <coughs> okay so now uh, okay uh, enough of this uh, digression that uh, okay we had this important digression that uh, um, uh, so how do you incorporate the gauge theory of s2 for only for left handed fields essentially so we incorporate uh, gauge theory of s2 only for left handed fields but then there is the problem that uh, both of them have different charges say for example electromagnetic charges are for the s2 doublet up and down are completely different for the electron and the neutrino are also completely different so this led glasho so coming back to the point which we started off with uh, this led glasho to say that electromagnetic theory uh, weak interactions weak and electromagnetic interactions should be described together so this was the basic idea of glasho which we sort of started earlier so how did he de- do that he said that uh, okay the normal u1 will not uh, uh, so this required a different u1 actually if you look into the um actual um, details because there are several issues with this s2 gauge theory as we'll see um this requires uh, this requires a separate u1 theory which is he called it as a u1 hypercharge uh u1 uh, y where y is the hypercharge hyper charge which is not the electric ma- electromagnetic charge so but s2 times this u1 s2 v times u1 hyper charge will go get described by will be get broke down will be related uh, okay we we'll, as we'll see it has to be broken down by uh uh two u1 uh, electromagnetic theory u1 electromagnetic theory which is essentially times g fermi uh, fermi theory fermi. 
So the basic mapping he did was that you should have a theory which you have uh, is to L essentially standing only for the uh, left handed fields uh, okay uh, describing the weak interactions so to L times u and y will break down to a Fermi theory times uh, at low energies. So at low energy should go to a Fermi theory times uh, u and l to magnetic theory that is the basic idea. But uh, uh, to implement it uh, it required a lot of things but anyway but this is the basic idea <clears throat> now what is this hypercharge so the hypercharge is defined as our hypercharge is set such that charge is fixed such that the old Gilman Nishijima relation is satisfied. You remember the old Gilman Nishijima relation which we discussed because there, there was something uh, which was uh, connecting uh, the strainness quantum number and the flavor uh, and uh, uh, the isospin with the electric charge. So, similar to that. So, here essentially, uh, so the it is essentially a re replication of the old uh, Gilman uh, Nishijima relation where the q electric charge is y or y by 2 times i3 so this is the electric charge this is the hypercharge this is the isospin So you fix um, uh, given the isospin, you fix your hypercharge such a way that you get back your uh, electric charge correctly. Okay. So the basic idea is that for the full SU2 doublet, for the full SU2 doublet, the hypercharge remains the same. So you can really gauge the theory. Okay. Now you want something. So the main point was that to introduce the hypercharge is because if you have some a different charge other than the electric charge, okay, which will take a, becomes at the end of the day becomes equivalent to the electric charge, such that the the uh, the full SU2 doublet, this full SU2 doublet should have the same hypercharge, okay. So this entire SU2 doublet should have the same. Not the electric charge is no longer the same, but if it has the same uh, hypercharge, okay, then I can gauge that theory. I can gauge that theory. No, I can really gauge it as a doublet, essentially completely gauge it as a doublet. So hypercharge is necessitated. The reason, uh, the reason why it's, it is necessary is because I want a same quantum number over the entire two different particles, the same quantum number for the entire left-handed part of the doublets essentially. So the hypercharge should be different for the left-handed doublets and would be different for the right-handed doublets. In the end, it turns out to be just the average charge actually. Uh, so this is the basic idea. What he said was that, okay, so if you have an extra U1 charge, uh, extra U1 theory, this U1 theory is not exactly equivalent to the electromagnetic theory, but you can organize that, you can gauge this entire theory, okay, gauge the entire SU2 cross U1. Okay, you can gauge this entire SU2 cross U1. Uh, okay, and if this, this gauging is only possible if the doublet would have the all the two particles on the doublet would have the same quantum numbers under some U1 symmetry. Now, this U1 symmetry would be some sort of then they can be gauged together. No, they can be gauged in with the same thing. So, that is the basic idea to introduce uh, the hypercharge. The hypercharge is now fixed such that you reproduce the electric charges after that. So you reproduce the electric charges would be after uh, after the uh, breaking of the symmetry. But anyway, okay, after breaking of the symmetry. So now let's, let's see. So if is it possible to have a high, hypercharge such that you get back your electric charges, okay, and uh, by adding the isospin. So let's just look at uh, some 
examples of this fixing of the hypercharges. So let's fix the hypercharges. Uh, so first we have uh, say, uh, so any doublet, let's just take the doublet. Uh, um, uh, easiest one, mu e, e. Left handed, left handed. Okay, both of them are left handed and then er. The isospin i3 reduces, isospin uh, is half for mu e field i3 is equal to minus half for e field okay left handed left hand left handed and for er is equal to 0 isospin is 0 okay so this would give me so let's look at uh, the hypercharge for um, uh, uh, for new e uh, this is new e l uh, by the way it's not written very well mm. So for new E L, let's just take Q is equal to Y by 2 plus uh, uh, I3. So that means Q is equal to 0, I3 is equal to half, y, uh, y by 2 uh, <coughs> is flux to be 2. So this has to satisfy this relation. So this will give me y is equal to one essentially. Okay, uh, there is a, mm, mm, minus one. Similarly, for el, let's look at el. So this is minus one is equal to minus half times y by two. So that gives me again the same thing minus half plus one. So y is equal to minus one. So you can fix the hypercharge to be the same for EL and new EL. For new EL and EL comes out to be the same. Okay, this is a matter of convention, but typically it is taken to be half or uh, uh, minus, in this case we have taken it to be minus one essentially. Uh, Q is equal to I3, oh sorry, it is I3 minus Y by 2. Okay, maybe mm, that is the reason, minus I3 minus Y by 2. So in this case, this just comes out to be plus one, plus one. Okay, so it comes out to be one in this case. But typically, you can put another half factor, another half factor, essentially, then it will turn out to be uh, half. Okay. So in our notation, it comes out to be one, but you can other notations. can give you half I will say a matter of convention that is not a problem actually ok um, but leave it leave it, it so it is same now if you do the same thing for the hadronic fields like uh, up and down quarks the hypercharge for this quark multiplet QL say 1 2 one first generation first generations QL 1 comes out to be 1 by 6. Uh, just check this okay check maybe it will come out to be because we are having a factor half difference it may come out to be 1 by 3 okay just check this okay now what happens to the hypercharges of the right handed fields
the hypercharger of right handed fields because they don't have any isospin q is equal to minus y by 2 okay because i3 is equal to 0 so that's it so y becomes minus 2 q for right handed fields Okay, so I3 is equal to 0 for these fields and so you have no um, um, uh, the hypercharge is just fixed in terms of the uh, charge, the electric charge actually. Anyway, the hypercharge is nothing but the average charge of these two fields. Say for example, if you take uh, uh, if you want uh, for the hadronic fields, it's 2 by 3 plus 1 by 3, so 2 by 3 plus 1 by 3, uh, 2 by 3 minus 1 by 3 uh, minus 1 by 3, so it's 1 by 2, okay, 1 by 3 so for the hadronic fields, U L and D L. The hypercharge is 1 by 6 and how do you get it? Because it's 2 by 3 minus 1 by 3 by half, okay, that gives me 1 by 6. So it is sort of the average electric charge of the multiplet. Okay. So now we sort of have all the ingredients to write the gauge theory. So to before writing the gauge theory, what we have is that we have um, Uh, so we have um, UL, DL, these are your left handed fields, uh, which is essentially that uh, they form a doublet and the right handed fields UR, DR, these are your uh, singlets and ratio 2. So this takes care of parity violation. Okay. Second point, introduce hypercharge. Okay, we introduce hypercharge such that SU two cross U one Y would be some uh, electromagnetic theory U one times Fermi theory. Because we know that Fermi theory also has some, uh, inter, uh, can be written in terms of this uh, uh, intermediate vector boson theory where GF is identified by 1 by MW square. So that much we have known, some identification is there. Times some electromagnetic theory at low energies. At high energies, this should be given by some other new symmetry which is essentially your uh, SU2 cross U1. So with this, we will start writing uh, um, a gauge theory. So we will start looking at the aspects of the gauge theories in the next uh, in the next lecture. Okay, so we'll stop here.